Hi folks, welcome to episode 31 of the Epochs of the Lotus Eaters. I'm joined by Bo, and by subscriber request, we are going to be talking about Gordon of Khartoum. So I don't know much about Gordon of Khartoum, to be honest. I've heard the name, and I understand that he was a colonial officer and for the British, uh, but that's about as far as my knowledge of it goes. So I'm just going to be taking a back seat as Bo explains everything about this too. <laughs> cool, yeah. Charles Gordon, Gordon of Khartoum, Gordon yeah. of China. Right. He was called before Gordon of Khartoum. Um, I think the first thing to say is that when we used to have an empire, um, we used to have heroes yes. of the empire as well. Yes, um, <laughs> it's a great, great, it's a great phrase. And whenever, I, when, I, sorry to diverge already, like, but whenever, whenever I see Americans talking about things, I'm like, look, whenever, you, whenever the Republicans have like, oh, you know, the uh, 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 Carl Rittenhouse and people like that, I'm always like, no, give them an honorific, the <laughs> heroes of the Republic. You know, that's what you should be calling them. You know, you need your heroes, and that's King Carl. Ex well, kind of, <laughs> but you know, President Carl. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know, hero, hero of the empire. I love, I love that term. I love these honorifics. Yeah, and so Gordon was among the most famous because mm. he was martyred. That sort of thing, just to cut to the uh, chase. Do a bit of a Columbo on this one. Maybe right. start with his death because he was so famous for his. He's sort of martyrdom, for want of a better word. Um, <laughs> it might be a more appropriate uh, Yeah, that, he's sort of a, a Christian martyr of the empire. I don't know. We'll get to it. But he yeah, could yeah. easily have not got himself killed. Right, right. So anyways, yeah. it's one of those. Um, but yeah, we had, you know, sort of perhaps the most famous, uh, sort of the Duke of Wellington or Lord Nelson. Mm. Um, you know, the further back you want to go, there's there's actually quite a lot of them. Charles Napier. I'd love to do an epoch on Charles Napier at some we, point. We he's will. like Gordon. It's just his whole life. It's just adventure the whole time. Uh, you know, like Baden Powell's one or yeah. Mountbatten was one of the last ones. Perhaps you could say yeah, at yeah. a push, born in the wrong an absolute era, push. Uh, and further you go back, you know, people like Clive of India yeah. or Marlborough, even. But anyway, the reason why Charles Gordon is so famous is that uh, he he died. You know, you get that whole thing like Heath Ledger or John Lennon or something mm. sort of adds to the luster of your memory. How old that was you, he when he, he was died? like fifty one, nearly so fifty two. Right, so it wasn't the tragic death in his youth, Alexander the Great. No, not right. quite. Um, <laughs> but he was considered just a great man and he died. Um, and so like the, the, the sort of later Victorian period and Edwardian mm. period, um, sort of lionized him or made him, you know, sort of elevated him yeah. much, much further than he would have been to the point where n not many people, unless you're a history nerd, would probably know much about him these days, but even in sort of world war one, world war two times, he would have been very well known, right, right. like Kitchener say, mm. um, everyone would have known his name. Everyone would have known about Gordon of Khartoum and mm. kind of what happened to him. Um, in fact, I'd like to start with a quote from yeah. Churchill's uh, River War, which is all about uh, the reconquest of the Sudan and the reconquest of Omdurman and Khartoum, which is all bound up with Gordon. Um, and one of the first lines he says is that he needs no introduction. as like, He's writing in the 1950s. Yeah. And so people in those days wouldn't really need an introduction you would have known yeah, about yeah, gordon yeah. Uh, but as we don't I'll, sh I'll read it. it's quite a long one if you don't mind yeah, go ahead. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and read it out it's again from the river war so winston churchill says quote <clears throat> charles gordon needs little introduction long before this tale begins his reputation was european and the fame of the ever victorious army was spread far beyond the great wall of china it is impossible to study any part of general gordon's career without without being drawn to all the rest uh, as his wild and varied fortunes led him from Sebastopol to Peking, from Gravesend to South Africa, from Mauritius to the Sudan, the reader follows fascinated. Every scene is strange, terrible or dramatic. Yet remarkable as the scenes are, the actor is more extraordinary, a type without comparison in modern times and with few likenesses in history. Rare and precious is the truly disinterested man. Potentates from different lands in different degree, the Emperor of China, the King of the Belgians, the Premier of the Cape Colony, the Khedive of Egypt, uh, competed to secure his services. The importance of his offices vary no less than their nature. One day he was a subaltern of sappers, on another he commanded the Chinese army. The next he directed an orphanage or was Governor General of the Sudan with supreme, supreme powers of life and death in peace and war, or served as private secretary, secretary to Lord Ripon. But in whatever capacity he laboured, he was true to his reputation. Uh, whether he is portrayed bitterly criticising the tactics of the assault on the Redan, that's in the Crimean War, or pulling the head of Wee Long from under his bedstead, 
and, and waving it in paroxysms of indignation before the astonished eyes of Sir Halliday McCartney, or riding alone into the camp of the rebel Suleiman and receiving the respectful salutes of those who meant to kill him, or telling the Khedive Ishmael that he must have the whole Sudan to govern, or reducing his salary to half the regulation amount because he thought it was too much, or ruling a country as large as Europe, or or collecting facts for Lord Ripon's uh, rhetorical efforts. We perceive a man careless alike in, uh, of the frowns of men or the smiles of women, uh, of life or comfort, wealth or fame. Uh, it was a pity that one, thus gloriously free from the ordinary uh, restraining influences of human s society, should found in his own character so little mental ballast. His moods were capricious and uncertain, his passions violent, his impulses sudden and inconsistent. The mortal enemy of the morning... Uh, the mortal enemy of the morning had become a trusted ally before the night. Uh, the friend he loved today, he loved tomorrow. Scheme after scheme formed in his fertile brain and jostled confusingly together. All in succession were pressed with enthusiasm. All at times were rejected with disdain. Uh, a temperate, naturally neurotic uh, neuroticism had been aggravated by an, acquainted, uh, an acquired habit of smoking. And the general carried... Uh, this to so great an extreme that he was rarely seen without a cigarette. He's nearly finished. <laughs> no, no, his, no, no, carry on. Uh, I'm really loving this. His virtues are famous among men. His daring and resource might turn the tide of war. His energy would have animated a whole people. His achievements are upon record, but it must also be set down that few more uncertain in, and impractical impracticable forces than Gordon have ever been introduced into administration and diplomacy. End quote. He sounds a lot like Britain's Alcibiades, just without the treason. <laughs> like this passionate, wild, but brilliant and successful man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the thing that seems <laughs> to come through again and again and again Love is that um, uh, despite sort of a rocky road to sort of reaching the pinnacles of yeah. government and the army, he was insubordinate and did what he wanted to do. Love it. He did what he thought was right. Hmm. Um, rather than the, abiding by the rules. Hmm. Um, and, and that he was... He was a very devoutly Christian, mm -hmm. uh, very sort of devoutly anti-slavery, uh, but we'll get into all of that. Mm. Um, so that's just sort of a bit of an overview of, of the Even man. the character of the um, man. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, he's ex um, exciting. I mean, yeah, yeah. What, what a great write-up from Churchill there. Uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, uh, I think, it, well, a lot of people were big fans. So Churchill is sort of a late Victorian Edwardian person, first and yeah. foremost, isn't he? You know, yeah. he's obviously famous for his role in World War II, but that was kind of towards the end of his life. I mean, yeah, he didn't he die until career. the 60s, but yeah, long when he was a that. young man, his formative years, mm. the late Victorian period, mm. in fact, Churchill in the himself. the empire, you know, yeah. doing, being a you know, colonial officer or whatever it was he was doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was the first Lord of the Admiralty in World yeah. War I, wasn't he, for example? I mean, Churchill fought in the reconquest of the Sudan. He oh, was a very, he? very young lancer. He was right. in a lancer regiment, actually personally killed a few people with his lance. Okay. Quite proud of that. I bet he is. <laughs> um, so, okay, let's start with the life of, of Gordon. He was, uh, he, his father was a, a general, or in the end a general, when he was born, his father was like a colonel or a major or something. But mm. in the end, his father was a, a general. And he had sort of, there was like 11 or 12 of the kids and he was like the fourth one. And there was no question that he would go to a military academy and mm. be in the army. Just no question at all. Um, they used to call it, wherever his father would be posted, the whole family would go. Right. Um, they used to call it following the drum. Right, right. Um, <laughs> and so uh, even though he grew up in Woolwich for a bit, he also spent a lot of time in Corfu because that was being controlled by the British in sort of the <clears> 1840s. <throat> mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, when he was in his teens, he comes back to Britain and goes to sort of a military uh, academy there. He was in the uh, artillery, or the Royal Engineers rather, which is a bit different to the Royal Engineers now. Right. Um, the Royal Engineers back then... Uh, were a lot more closer to infantry or even special forces. They were the ones that were supposed to do skirmishing really? and go into breaches first and do some of the really, oh, really like dangerous work. Sapping the Royal and Engineers. undermining. Exactly, and, sapping. Yeah, right, okay, yeah. Some of the most dangerous yeah. work was the Royal Engineers. Right. Um, so it wasn't like a, a sort of just another wing of the services. Mm. Um, it's not fair to think of them like that now, but certainly not then. It was quite a serious thing to right, be in the yeah. engineers. So anyway, and he went to the academy and it was called The Shop. And um, uh, but was held back a couple of times for insubordination, for like punching <laughs> a corporal in the face, um, and just for not doing as he's told. Being quite a naughty boy, actually. Like um, I love these characters. Like deliberately um, letting mice and rats run free in the commandant's house. Things like this, smashing right. windows and stuff. Pretty naughty, really. Not very uh, aligned with military discipline. 
No, not exactly. But also on top of that, on top of being naughty, um, uh, the things he was supposed to do, he did well. And mm. other than being insubordinate, was thought of as a great prospect. Mm. He had a lot of the other qualities needed to be a great junior officer, like being very impetuous, completely disdained violent, uh, um, uh, like uh, danger. Danger, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was um, just chomping at the bit to yeah. get involved. In yeah, fact, yeah. he kept sending. Uh, letters to the the war office, just yeah. begging to be sent somewhere. Um, <laughs> uh, well, and so he got his wish because before too long, he was still a young man, he was still sort of like nineteen or twenty years old, sent out to the Crimea. Um, and what year was this? Uh, it's the fifties, the eighteen right. fifties. We'll be talking about here. Um, is it, uh, yes. Um, and so if people don't know, just a super quick overview of that. It's the Ottoman Empire is the sick man of Europe mm -hmm. and he's weak. And the Russians are trying to invade the Crimea. Mm -hmm. um, and the French and the British decide mm -hmm. that we'll prop up the Ottomans and thwart the Russians wherever possible. So in effectively, the British and the French army fight a war on behalf of the Ottomans in the Crimea against the Russians. Yes. But so this is where the charge of the Light Brigade comes from. Yes. It's yes. magnificent, but it's not war. Mm. No, it was a mistaken... Order. That's right. It's not war. It was a hideousy. Yeah, yeah. But at least it was heroic. So, you know. Uh, a cavalry charge <clears> headlong <throat> into a Russian battery of cannons is not yeah. what you're supposed to do. But didn't they take it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then and then ran back. Yeah, well, of course, the counter attack, you can't resist it because they'd lost like a third of their men. Yeah. You know. And on the way back, they get bombarded yeah, yeah, yeah. again. Yeah. Um, but, but in fact, we captured a couple <laughs> of the cannons and those are the cannons. Uh, oh, no, it's that Sebastopol eventually we took the cannons and that's what we cast Victoria Crosses out of even to oh, this day. Really? Yeah, the Victoria I mean, Crosses cast from Russian cannons uh, captured at Sebastopol. That. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, so that's an interesting little fact. We'll, for, we'll talk about that another time. Yeah, I could do a whole thing on the VC. Yeah. I'd love to actually. Um, so anyway, he was at the Crimean, uh, which was, um, it was no joke, it was quite a bloody war. It was one of, oh, the, first, so yeah. one of the first examples just before the American Civil War. And it was one of the first times when guys can, thousands of guys can get mowed down in mm. an afternoon. Mm. It hadn't happened much before the Crimean. Um, and so there was, and there was terrible, terrible disease. Mm -hmm. Loads and loads and loads of people died of the cold because mm. they weren't given enough warm clothes. Uh, silly things like this. Because um, nobody learned the lessons from Napoleon. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and so loads of people on both sides died of sickness and the cold more than died in, in mm. action. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, well, there's one line actually I'll just mention from that is that he sent a letter home. People used to write letters a lot. Yes. Um, a lot. And uh, Gordon's, hundreds and hundreds of Gordon's letters survived. they didn't have emails. Um, yeah. It's the only way you could communicate. I mean, it sounds really obvious to say it out mm. loud, but um, just a much, much more important thing, letters. And in one of them, he says to his sister, his older sister, Augusta, who um, sent lots of letters to, there's a line where he says, uh, quote, to the Crimea, hoping without having a hand in it to be killed. Um, and so there's this yeah, thing. Okay. Um, he's got this uh, thread throughout his life where he's some, happy to die a violent, valiant death. Lots of people yeah. said he had um, a, a death wish. Not not ex exactly suicidal, like you're terribly no. depressed and you're actually hoping, really, you want to be dead. Not that. It's more romantic, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but it's, if yeah. I should fall in battle, there's no problem. Yeah, that would be not a problem with yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And people had that a lot more in, yeah. in, in olden days. Uh, there's a parallel, I'm thinking, there's a bit in um, some um, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia's mm. letters, saying, I'm going out, I'm going to go on my own into the middle of Arabia, and, um, well, if I get killed, then so be it. Yeah. Um, sort of hoping for it in a way, well, just it's, like that. It's, it's, no hoping. it's noble and manly to die mm. in battle. Mm. It's be better than dying afraid or, you know, weak on your bed when you're ancient, you know. Yeah, 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 we cling to life at all costs, don't we? These days, because at all we're, costs. we're purely materialist. Yeah. You know, we've got it no used to really matter the, the, <clears throat> the nature of your death. Yeah. It used to be really important. And all throughout human history as well. Like and if was, you believe there was another world, another life after, and that was dictated by how you died, how you met your death, yeah. then even more so, sorry. Abs no, no, absolutely, but we're totally materialist now. All it is is uh, the, uh, an extra day of survival, please. And it's like, yeah, but it could be an awful day. You know, mm. But anyway, I heard someone say the other day, describe it as the slow defeat of old age. Yeah. yeah, yeah no, that's... <laughs> You're sort of spared that if you, if you, absolutely, uh, if you have a, a glorious absolutely. death in battle. Um, so yeah, that mindset, people have said that um, it, it might have been a touch beyond fearlessness, 
and actually almost embracing it. Recklessness, um, yeah. And all that sort of plays out when you know exactly how we died in, yeah. in the end. Because um, he could have avoided it relative, well, very easily, actually. Yeah, but you're 51, um, you've had a great life. <laughs> May as well go out in blaze of glory. Yeah. Anyway, so Karen. <laughs> um, um, well, so uh, there's a, another line where uh, he, was, he was still sort of a, um, a junior lieutenant. Well, how, um, how did he do in Crimea? Yeah, very well. So right, he was okay. like he was a, an officer. He was a yeah. junior lieutenant, or became first lieutenant during the Crimea, I believe. Um, and uh, at his job of being a sapper mm -hmm. was very, very, very good. And in fact, in dispatches, there's one line that says, obviously from a senior officer, it says, "quote If you want to know what the Russians are up to, send for Charlie Gordon." Mm. <laughs> so he knew. Apparently, mm. also he was on the front lines loads. Mm. In the Crimea, you know, less so as he gets more and more senior. Hmm. And from time to time, he would sort of put himself in danger. But in the Crimea, where he's still a young man, apparently he was exposed to enemy fire loads. There was a couple of times in like the trench, it's like a trench system hmm. outside Sebastopol. Um, and a, a few times, like every guy on the left and right of him was killed. Yeah. And he was just covered in mud and blood. Just luck. So, yeah, guy, yeah, a little bit of luck. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of people from sort of the Victorian period who go on to be sort of famous generals and things. And yeah. and their earlier life, it was like, well, they were so lucky to survive yeah. it. Well, lots of people from World War One, like how did Hitler survive World War One? He was lucky, right? Well, you lots know, of people throughout history, to be honest. Like I can think of loads of people throughout <laughs> ancient history who were just exactly the same. How did you get through this? Mm -hmm. But somehow they did. And, you know, there we go. Like Socrates is one of them. Socrates fought in a mm -hmm. bunch of battles. And it's like... If he'd died in the first battle, Western philosophical history would have been totally different. Mm, you know, mm. it would have been totally different. But instead, mm. he survives and, you know, ends up complaining about everything and getting himself killed. So... <laughs> to watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.